Thank you. Oh, I was about to click the button. I, I trust that nobody minds us uh, recording this session. Um, I don't really have much to say of, a, of an admin nature about the start of the course. I hope that everybody's receiving uh, by one channel or another the um, the updates for this this course, um, which are coming through. Oops, where did we go? Several channels. Um, I'm, I'm just posting a link in the um, chat sidebar to the latest update, and um, we're trying to use the nodal learning management system as a way of emailing people, and we're trying to post all the updates on the blog and. Um, I'm always afraid that uh, that there'll be somebody who will miss one of the postings in one of the channels. So I hope you're all hope you're all getting updates uh, reasonably well. So we've got 21 people in the room at the moment. Uh, numbers are growing, not quite as many as last week. Um, can I ask everybody in the room first of all just to give us a little smiley face to say that you can. Hear me well enough? Hi, Anna. Hi, Betsy. Chris. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Betsy. Haley, Eileen, Eileen, Don. Is it Eileen or Eileen? I really should know that. Um, hello, James. James, well done in uh, getting signed in. Um, that really was happening in real time over in between the email and you joining the Moodle. Um, Santu, Lisa, Louise. Oh, excellent. Hi, Louise, Nancy, Roger, uh, Sarah S. Um, might be Sarah, Sarah Shelton, possibly. Uh, Wheezy and Zoe. Smiles. <laughs> excellent. Um, so I guess uh, all aboard that's coming aboard. Um, and again, hello, Adele. Um, Adele joining this session. Are it, it's sort of a it's a difficult question to ask because presumably you are the people who know when things are happening and when to click and how to get in, um, and it's it's always hard to know who doesn't know things. And we're trying to go through the list and contact people individually who may have uh, intended to be in um, various aspects of the course but haven't found their way. So all I would like to do is invite everybody who has found their way to keep an eye out in the various channels that you monitor for anybody who might not have found their way to either the live sessions, the topic discussions, or the activities that are going on. Uh, and I guess I should just say a great big thank you to everybody who is making the discussion so rich in the topics and in the activities. We are halfway through the peer review workshop for activity one. Uh, a smiley face for anybody in the audience today who submitted something to activity one. Oh, excellent, Haley. I know there's a few more. I think there's a few more there. Oh, Betsy Saras, yeah. Cool. Um, uh, we're trying to encourage people to not just submit it and hope to receive peer feedback, but also to give peer feedback. People are still joining the session. Um, yeah, great badge ready. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, uh, learning technologists get ready to issue the badge. Hi, I see John has joined us. Um, all right. Well, if there are, are, are there if I could just do a quick yes no poll, do you have any questions? Anybody in the room have any questions to ask about uh, the operation or function of the course, or should we move straight into Sylvia's session? Um, excellent. No, 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 no. I see the red cross is coming up. Thank you. If anybody does have a question about the operation of the course, uh, drop it into the chat. Marion will try and pick it up. Uh, we can pick it up at the end. But now, without any further ado, it really is my pleasure to uh, welcome Sylvia to uh, this guest 
slot. Sylvia, as you know, has been um, absolutely instrumental in our being able to run this course with a um, synchronous uh, audiographic learning environment. The Blackboard Collaborate environment um, runs on um, in, in the Scope community. Sylvia is the head of that. And Sylvia, I'd just like to say thank you very much and hand over to you. That's terrific. Thank you, George. Um, I'm turning on my video here because I'm, I've decided in this session I'm just going to try everything and really overload the system and see if we can do it. <laughs> if it holds, uh, holds too much bandwidth, then, then for sure I'll, I'll turn it off. And I always have bandwidth issues from where I live. I'm, I'm in um, the interior of British Columbia, Canada, and I'm in a small community, and we were lucky to even get internet. So, um, so it's it's always a little bit of a challenge doing things like this. <clears throat> so, okay, okay, George, good. Yeah, we might break it. That's fine. Um, so yes, I'm beaming in from my from my home office. It's a little bit messy in the background. <clears throat> I meant to clean it up, but you know, um, it just didn't get to that. Um, and I'd like to also introduce Hilda Engraney, who's joining us from the Vancouver um, BC campus office. Hilda and I are um, part of the professional learning team at, at BC campus. And um, basically what we do is, is we support, um, we, we find ways um, for, for educational professionals across the province to connect and learn together and share resources. Um, let me just post it in the chat. I'll just give you the link to BC campus just so you have that URL in there. So yeah, so today I'm, I'm going to be um, talking briefly about building these open communities. Um, and I'm using an online community um, which I steward called Scope as a case example. And I'll show you bits of that community. <clears throat> but in keeping with the theme of um, week two for this MOOC um, on teaching groups, I thought we would use our time, um, a good, good chunk of time, um, to do a group activity. So it's a bit of an experiment. Um, it's, it's probably a huge risk because I've got all sorts of things happening here with breakout rooms and that sort of thing. But really there's nothing like just rolling up our sleeves and, and trying it out um, just to, to try out some of these things we talk about all the time. Um, so we're, we're going to uh, um, take a few risks, see what happens. <clears throat> so first of all, um, first of all, the um, definition of a community of practice. Um, I know that a lot of people come up with very complicated ways of describing communities of practice. Some people argue that a learning community isn't a community of practice and, and vice versa. Um, but I like to use Etienne Wenger's um, definition because I think it's, it's very simple. Um, it really gets to the point. And Jenny McNassett talked about Wenger last, last week and <clears throat> I also share her enthusiasm um, for his work on, on social learning systems. So I think that this really, this one sentence really captures nicely what we want to do in terms of um, working together as, as communities. Um, and so what, what do we mean by open um, when we're talking about um, learning environments? Really there's, there's lots of ways of looking at it. People have their own views on what it means to be open. Um, a course, a, a formal course can, can be open. I mean this in, in many ways is a, <clears throat> This MOOC is, is a formal course because some people are taking it for credit, um, but it, in, it's also open to, to the rest of the world and anybody who wants to participate. Um, it can be distributed. It doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be online. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, usually it means free. Hopefully it does. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean free for everybody. And, and a case in point, again, is, is this MOOC. So, you know, if you want to be assessed, then of course there is a fee assigned to that. But the participation part it, itself is, is free. Um, open enrollment, there might be a cap on the number of people you can let in. And the content um, can have an open license. So in some cases, people are calling their courses and learning activities open, but they're not assigning an, an open license to the content. So there's lots of different variations on open. Um, someone just testing? Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, 
So, I, you know, one thing I want to to talk about a bit today is, is the fact that open, the fact that learning activities are open, that does it actually change things um, quite a bit in terms of planning and facilitation. And I won't go into a lot of detail with, you know, with this list, but I just want to give you a glimpse of some of the things that um, you need to think about when, when an activity is open. And by activity, I just mean anything. It can be an online workshop, it can be a course, a seminar, what, whatever. Um, but always there's the potential for things to be a little more complex. You don't have as much control over what's going to happen. Um, there's lots of new possibilities. Often you get people who are stepping up and taking on a facilitation role. Um, there's lots of new formats, um, things happening in different places. Sometimes it gets a little complicated technology-wise. Um, it can be more flexible than, than uh, a regular course, obviously, but sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I think, you know, in my experience with working um, or with, with participating in MOOCs, for example, I find sometimes there's a little bit too much emphasis on the organizational aspect and, and sometimes um, it takes away from, from the actual discussion and the dialogue and, and, in other words, it's sort of less on the intellectual side. So much is, is um, so much focus is on the technology itself and getting people all set up. But I think we're getting better at that. Um, so I, I'll just go into <clears throat> just a quick overview of the Scope Online community. So this is um, this is a community that, that I'm involved in um, and have been for, for many years, uh, since 2005. And prior to Scope, I was involved in another online community called the Global Educators Network. And in many ways, um, Scope is modeled after the Global Educators Network. And that started way back in the 90s. So I've been around for a little while doing this, this kind of work. Um, so scope is um, is just in a nutshell. It's it's an online international community. Um, we I would, I would say that it's open on on many fronts. There's lots of ways to to look at the the ways that scope has is open. It's it's free. Um, membership is absolutely free. It's open to the public. There's no login required um, for most of the sites. So people are free to just read along, and alert, do whatever, whatever they, they have complete access to the site. And it's a little bit different from, <coughs> say, the, <coughs> excuse me, the MOOC, the Moodle that is used for um, this MOOC, where you do need to sort of click through as a guest to access um, areas on the site. So in, in scope, it's, it's completely wide open. And the core activity in scope is, is a series of scheduled seminar discussions, and these are all facilitated by volunteers. Um, I used to call it a monthly series, but um, we have actually taken a little hiatus, so we haven't had a, a seminar discussion yet in 2013. Um, but essentially, it's <clears throat> it's the it's the activity and scope that really sort of keeps the momentum going. Um, but we also host special interest groups, um, which are essentially communities of practice within this bigger community. So I mentioned that it's international, and, and, and right now we have, we can say we have 4,000 members, um, roughly, distributed, distributed across 60 plus countries. Um, but really, in, real, in reality, we actually don't know how many people um, are participating in SCOPE because it is wide open. There is no requirement to log in, as I mentioned. Um, to access the, the activity. So, so it's, a, it's a little hard to get a handle on how many people um, are participating. And I'll just um, give you a glimpse. This isn't very easy to see, unfortunately. I'm looking on both monitors here. In fact, it's really not easy. So let me just give you a direct link to this <clears throat> image, if you'd like. Um, this is um, a summary that Hilda prepared, actually. It's a, it's a summary of all of the um, topics that we've discussed since 2005 in the Scope community. Um, the link that I posted there will take you to an image that is clickable so you can get through to the individual um, topics. But basically, that this gives you an overview of, of um, the types of things we talk about. Most of the topics are actually emerged through um, the discussions. So, uh, we don't, you know, sort of have a committee and decide ahead of time what's important and what we should be 
talking about in the community, all of those ideas come from the members and, and through participation. And, and it, you can see in this diagram that a lot of the, the um, topics are related in different ways. And so the, the colors um, convey that. Yeah, I really love this diagram that Hilda did, so I'd like to show it. <laughs> um, so this is um, taking you just to a screenshot of the <clears throat> scheduled discussion area seminar discussions, we call them. <clears throat> what we do is we have um, one space in scope where we have all of these um, seminar discussions. And so the full archive is available for hopefully forever. Um, um, but it, as I mentioned, this white is wide open. No login is, is needed to, to read it. Um, we have a summary by year of the topics that were discussed. Um, we've you know, not only just have discussions, sometimes we are, um, you know, we embark on pretty ambitious projects. And I point to one here that is writing an ebook about ebooks. And, and so the, the um, project that we worked on for that month was to actually write an ebook. And we sort of halfway got there. I think we, we, uh, um, we made a, a dent on a book anyway. And we use a lot of different tools, not all in um, Moodle. And yes, it is, Scope is, is a Moodle site. Um, we experiment wildly, so we always bring in tools from lots of different um, areas. So uh, just whatever, you know, whatever we feel like, whatever we think will serve our purpose in our discussion, we use it and bring it in. And so this is, is an example of um, a special interest group or you know, a community space within the community. We have a, a group, um, we call ourselves community enthusiasts, and basically we, um, we have uh, annual face-to-face -face meeting in Vancouver and in between we have a place to sort of put our artifacts from those meetings and there's sometimes a little discussion in between but not a whole lot. Um, but as I said, we bring in content from other places, um, embed content. We, we really um, take full advantage of, of the Moodle platform. It's nice and flexible that way for, for doing this. So how do we make all this happen? Basically, we, we work a lot with volunteers. We, um, we couldn't do it without volunteers. We only have, um, you know, just very limited staff at BC campus, but we actually managed to accomplish quite a bit with that staff because of, of volunteers. Um, but we also try to partner as much as we can with other um, organizations and other people. And, and I mean, a good example of that is the, um, is this MOOC. Um, last year, we were involved in, in first steps into learning teaching and, and again this year but we we've, we've also partnered with other communities we've worked on other MOOCs with with other organizations and so on and, and so that's how we make it all happen so um, this again is is kind of a a full list that could take a, a full session to, to go through but I just want to touch on some of the things that we've done in scope that I think um, have contributed to the success. And, and one is, and that I've mentioned a few times in terms of openness, is that um, we do allow that participation <clears throat> on the periphery. Um, we, you know, people are, are able to uh, sort of peek in and see what's happening and get a real feel for the culture of the community before they actually take that initial step to contribute um, something. And, and we've set it up so that at that moment where somebody feels compelled to contribute to a discussion, it's very easy to quickly create an account and just get right to, to the reply button and, and carry on. Um, we don't ask for a lot of information about the members, just you know, basically their name and email address and key country. I think that's, that's all we ask for. So it, uh, we really encourage that, that um, participation on the periphery. And the stewardship part of it, I think, is, is really important. I've, um, I've been involved a long time in, in this community, but I try as much as possible to involve other people in that role of a community steward just to um, you know, talk about, you know, what, what needs to be done, what, what would improve it, and that sort of thing. And the, the historical aspect, I think, is, is really important. Because we do archive all of our discussions, um, we're able to, um, you know, get a nice glimpse of what's happened in, in this field um, over the years. But we also can bring in some of those conversations and keep moving them forward. Um, so you see a lot of um, 
instances of that in the scope discussions where we'll connect back to a, you know, a, a seminar discussion that happened, you know, seven years ago and say, well, look at, we were, you know, this is exactly what we said seven years ago. Why haven't, <laughs> why haven't we changed anything? Why are we still doing the same thing? Um, and I mentioned also the, um, the scope seminars, because it's a regular thing to, to look forward to, it, that it does sort of build a rhythm and, and variety, you know, the topics that change each month into the community. So it, that's what keeps people um, coming back. Um, and I think I mentioned most of these other things. And I said another, you know, thing that I will highlight is, is the mutual exchange of services and collaboration, I think. Um, you know, using this MOOC as an example, just being able to work together with other other institutions and organizations to make things happen. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to pop right into um, what we're going to just, this is starting a, a bit of a setup for the activity um, that we're going to be doing together. And I think Time-wise, I'm doing okay, it's hard to say. No, I'm a little bit over, but we'll make it, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> so what you see on, on the screen now is, is, a, is a framework that um, I quite like because it's so completely simple. Um, it's based on Morton Slate Paulson, um, and it's, it's nothing new. It's, he came up with this framework um, sometime in the mid-90s, maybe early 90s, and it's, a, it's just a way of looking at facilitator functions, um, what the, the types of things you need to think about um, when you're um, planning and facilitating at any kind of learning activity. And in this case, we're, you know, we're thinking about open online learning activities. Um, so, if you, you know, organizational, I think that, that's probably pretty straightforward. It's, you know, types of questions like how will people get access how will they know what to do, um, that sort of thing, just, you know, how, how will everything be organized? The social aspect really is quite simply the, um, you know, how do you create an environment for learning? Um, I think that's the simplest way of, of describing social. And then intellectual, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty important one. It's, you know, how do we, how do we know what to talk about? Um, what's important to talk about? How do you decide that? And and um, how do you know that people are even learning? Um, and and actually, um, Paulson has a separate category for assessment, and I, I kind of roll that into intellectual because I think it's it's um, tied in so closely that um, you know the question about how do you know that people are learning? What what are the indicators of success? Those kinds of things are all rolled into the intellectual. Um, side. So that's just a simple framework that we're going to be using for our breakout activity. Okay. So what I'm going to do is give you, oh wait a minute, let me see. Okay, let me just describe the activity first and then, <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll lead you through um, how we're going to use the tools to accomplish this. Um, we have three breakout rooms that are set up, and so what you're going to do is distribute um, yourselves among these three um, spaces, and you can choose which one to go to, and I'll, I'll give you some information about how to do that. Um, but I thought to, to think about the intellectual, social, and organizational framework that, um, that I just mentioned, that maybe it would be um, more fruitful if we think about a certain case of what, what is it we want to do. So, so maybe if we come up with, with um, I'm not, what, I su what I'm suggesting here is, is that we're planning an, an upcoming open online workshop. It doesn't have to be a workshop. It could be like a, a module within your course or something like that. But, um, so if we think of something real that we're, we're planning um, when we talk about these different areas. So what I'll do is send you into your, um, breakout rooms, and you will spend 10 minutes or so um, just reviewing and, and planning uh, or, or brainstorming some questions that you should consider in that specific area. So if you choose social, you'll be thinking about questions you should be thinking about when planning um, this learning activity from the social perspective. 
Um, then I'm going to bring you back into the main room uh, after 10 minutes, and I'll put up a timer um, so that you can see. The t when I when you put up the timer, you're going to see it at the top of the uh, Blackboard Collaborate room. So you can see when you need to come back again. And what I want you to do is just um, report back to the main group. Um, and just select two of the uh, questions that you came up with in your group to report back. Okay, so let me motor through some of these steps and a little bit about the tools you'll be using. And then I'll see if you have any questions before I send you off. Okay, so breakout rooms. Um, you'll see in the participant, or, yeah, the participant list at the bottom there are three gray areas, um, intellectual, organization, and social. So those are actually separate rooms. And I'm going to um, just have you choose which one is of interest to you. We'll have a moderator in each room to help out. And you'll be able to move around um, these breakout rooms. So probably just move to one room and stay there. But if you want to move to another room, that's absolutely fine. And Hilda did these great screenshots for us. So this is, this is really helpful. Um, so I encourage you not to move yet. I see some people are starting, because then you won't be able to hear. <laughs> um, oh, Haley hopefully will come back again. Um, so you're in the main room now. To move to another room, there's a pull-down menu right beside the button, as you can see, just under your name. And that's going to allow you to move into the different rooms. You just select the one you want, and it'll just be popped right in there. And then when you're in the breakout room, as I mentioned, you'll have um, a moderator in there to help you out. Um, I noticed that some people um, are having problems with the pull-down menu, so I might be able to move you into breakout rooms. So just hold tough. We'll see who's still having problems after we do this. Um, in the breakout room, of course, you can use the mic, um, the talk button, uh, use the chat area. And the moderators are going to um, are going to save the chat area because that part of this session is not recorded. Okay, and then um, in each room, and I'm going to just post the links. This is more for the benefit of the moderators. We're using what's called a web tour. And so these links will actually take you right to um, the, the correct page in your room, and I've set up a pre-set up um, a page for each room. If the web tour doesn't work, then of course you can open these on your browser. And what it is basically is a shared sticky space, so you can create stickies and move them around on this board, and you can all do that at the same time. So it doesn't matter if it doesn't work right in Blackboard Collaborate, you can still do it um, in your browser. Okay, and now so to create a sticky, you'll see when you get in there, it's just just click on this plus sign that you'll see at the bottom of your board, and a sticky will come up. It'll just say double click to edit. You just double click, type it, and then you can move it around. Very simple. Okay, and then the last thing is. Um, your board might get a little bit full. I've already preloaded a lot of stickies on the board just in the interest of time so that you can see some of the questions that, um, that I've come up with, basically. And I've, I've done this activity before. I should show you. I, I did, I've only done it face to face. And I just used these lunch bags. <laughs> and let me just hold it up to the camera. And, um, and people just pick out the cards out of a lunch bag. So it's the same idea, except we're doing it online. So if the board gets cluttered, you can always make it bigger by just pulling the corner of it. Anybody can do that. Um, and you can click on the magnifying glass to make things bigger and smaller. OK, that's just what the social board looks like. I just have that as a backup just to show you. But you'll see it once you get into your room. So basically, again, just to recap, the group task is to um, move into your room of choice and then come back to the main room with one to two key questions to consider when 
designing an open workshop. And somebody's raising their hand. So go ahead and take the mic. Sylvia, I can't see who it is. I don't know why. Do that again, Marion. Sorry, Mr. I can't see. I can't see who's raised their hand. Oh, Cause it's not. It's not showing in my window. I don't know whether it is in George's or Neil's. Okay. Um, hello, it's George here. No, I heard a ding, but then the, uh, I didn't see any hand raisings. Sign, so maybe somebody clicked a button by mistake. Uh, I've got my mic on. Marion's got her mic on. Sylvia's got her mic on, and that's all the mics that are showing. So anybody? Never mind. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> so I'm setting the timer for 10 minutes. Some of you have already moved, so you can't hear me yet. Um, so off you go. Select your room, and I'll start the timer, and I'll bring you back to the main room after 10 minutes. Anybody who's still left in the main room, if you need help, just let me know. I'm still, I just hang out here and help. <laughs> so, um, Alexandra, I think you're the only one in the main room, and John, um, you're the only one, that, oh no, two more, let's see, Louise and Nancy. Do you need any help getting into Breakout rooms. Okay, Nancy, I um, see your question. So when you click on the breakout rooms, the space that comes up is one with graphics all over the screen. So that's absolutely what you should see. Um, okay, I think I think I'm understanding. So, so each room does have um, a screen up with graphics with sticky notes all over it. So that's correct. So if you move into the room on um, the topic of your choice, then hopefully the right page will be showing there. And yes, unfortunately, iPad is a very limited experience in Blackboard Collaborate. You can, you know, it's it's more a consumer kind of model um, at this point with that app. So there's not a whole lot that you can do um, right on the iPad in Blackboard Collaborate. But what you could do is um, open up one of these pages on your browser. And you can still um, maneuver the sticky notes or add new ones and so on. You just, you just, I, I, I'm going to see if I can get you maybe into one of the rooms. Um, which one would you like to get into with that, with Santi? Okay, hopefully that worked out for you. <laughs> and Louise, I just I just scrolled up and I saw your message as well that you're losing sound. Um, so let me just type in case you can't hear me. Hold on. I think you could. I, I, I and I, we sort of do that in the pot cert at a Maricosta College. People share tours of their courses. But um, I think it would be great to have that like massive. All right. So um, I've just the timer went off, and so I just took the liberty of bringing everybody back to the main room. Um, I did a sweep through a couple of the rooms, and um, as expected, there were some issues. And that's good because one of the things that we hopefully can do right now is just a little debrief um, and and uh, just talk about how we could have done this differently, what you know, how to plan for the 
unexpected, that sort of thing. So but first, if anybody from um, wants to start um, from, say, the intellectual group, did you come back with a couple of key questions to consider when designing an open workshop um, from that perspective? Do you want to grab the mic, somebody? Uh, hi, I can grab a mic, but I'm not sure that uh, I just managed to pop back into the room um, as I was moved back from the breakout room into the main room, Collaborate crashed on me, so I just had to start and start and stop again. Um, <laughs> um, what okay, this yeah, so what we were doing is just if anybody wants to report back, was there one or two questions that they did come up with? It might be that you didn't actually get to that um, in the short amount of time, but just to see if anybody from, say, the intellectual group to start, or George, you were the organizational group. Do you want to go ahead and, and just uh, talk about your experience? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I can certainly talk about our experience. Three out of the five people in the room did not have microphones, so we it took a while to sort of begin to negotiate away from me simply talking because I could. Um, and I tried to stop talking and move over to just using the chat. And people were worried that it had gone terribly quiet. Um, then we had a problem initially with the web tour not loading. And uh, Sylvia popped into the room and reloaded it. But I had gotten everybody over to just the browser window. We clicked and opened the organizational um, uh, chart, I, I'll call it. It's not an organizational chart, obviously, but the, the uh, Scumbler um, sticky screen. And we started to play around with it, moving the, moving the um, existing uh, tags around and started putting some of our own up. But what I'm going to have to do is ask Haley or um, Christina and Louise, and who else was in there? Lisette, were you in our room? Um, and and uh, were, there, were there some key, uh, uh, in one part, the organizational uh, implication is that um, we need to be careful about using um, heavy technology. <laughs> it's hardly fair to call it heavy, but um, you get a sort of a quick glimpse of what might be possible and then need to move on. Yes, exactly. Haley asked what pla yes. So yeah, Haley's question that she's posted into the what platforms will the workshop be available on? That's not a meta question about this workshop. That's a question that you need to ask when planning a workshop. Have I got that right, Haley? I think I've captured what you said. Yeah, thanks. That's what I thought. Yeah, one needs to consider the platforms um, that the workshop will be accessible on. Right, that's a really good one. And and I think that um, you know, just thinking about if we move into a little bit of debrief on this activity itself, what I what would have been better was to have a warning ahead of time and an outline of what the plans were and what tools you would need. So we had someone on an iPad, for example, who couldn't actually move to a room or when she got to the room, see um, the web tour. So interesting stuff like that. <laughs> That's great. How about somebody from the intellectual group? Um, I, I was the facilitator. I'm happy to talk, but, but um, everybody in the room was chatting, so I'm happy to hand over to one of them as well, equally. <laughs> Whether it was a Chris or Anna or... So we want to feedback. I could um, give a little feedback. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, first of all, I thought it was a really interesting problem solving with Trumpler and uh, resorting to the whiteboard uh, worked well. Um, Anna asked um, a really great question about in, in planning this um, this uh, event. Um, how do learners learn in this online space? And Marion was well consider what the content is, and that, um, and she gave a great example. I thought of MOOCs and in, in designing a MOOC, what what is to be learned, 
And then I added that, well, you know, a lot of it depends on how a MOOC or a course designer would value the connectivist principle of distributed learning and emergent learning. And, and that links directly to the social and organizational on how you, how you make, allow that, encourage that to happen. How's that? That's terrific. Yeah, that's that's um, that's uh, it's very good that you came in within that short time, um, just negotiating the technology and everything else to actually come up with something so coherent. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for that, um, Marion. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, not really. No, no. Um, very good participants. <laughs> I mean, I just we we did spend a lot of time struggling with the tools and just abandon them and had a good chat, as Chris said, so thank you anyway. Wonderful, okay. All right, how about the social group? Anybody want to come forward from that group? Yeah, hi, uh, we had a bit of problem with the technical difficulties, and we end up using the chat uh, area, and some of, some of uh, the people can't really see the question, so it's a bit hard to know the two quick questions, but we talk about the concern on posting our uh, own personal information into the public. And if anyone from the group would like to add more onto it, we had, I think we had Neil, Lisette, Lisette, and Martin, if you want to add on. Hi, Alison. Can I, oh, Eileen really made, made one of the best points, and I don't know if Eileen wants to just sort of make say that in her own words. I think it slightly went over my head a little bit, so I'm still trying to get my head around what that point was. Eileen. Eileen, do you want to grab the mic? I think Eileen's... Yay. It looks like I have it. Um, I was concerned about how um, there was a question posing a separation between personal and um, professional. And one of the things about making professional decisions is often what you bring from your personal life to them. So in those social spaces, making it possible for people to talk about how personal impacts professional seemed really important to me rather than a separation, make room for that conversation. Yes, exactly. Oh, looks like somebody else wants to grab the mic. Go ahead. Uh, that that was me. That that's for me, Elaine, Eileen. One of the key questions of the sort of personal, professional, reflective practice, and how you sort of um, manage aspects of your identity in in these online worlds. And that that you know, learning is a is you know quite a have has a big personal dimension to it, and it has a big professional dimension to it. We who are, as it were, professional learners, um, need to need to sort of struggle with how much of the sort of social personal gets into the uh, professional learning world. Yes, and some of it gets a little tricky, and, and um, actually. Last week, um, Jenny talked about that a little bit, or actually might be mixing up another conversation I'm having with Jenny. <laughs> but yeah, really, the, the, um, you know, knowing how much to bring in from your personal life, and, and I agree that it, you know, it, it adds so much. I, I just find that um, some of the glimpses I get into other people's lives through Twitter and Facebook and so on really has made a difference in the work that I do in online communities. Um, because once we get into those deep discussions, I have a just a better idea of who I'm, who I'm, who I'm talking to, and who you know what they're bringing to the conversation. And it's, um, I think for you know I, I don't know if this is unique to my situation, but because I work primarily online, and you know the opportunity to actually meet people face to face, and those opportunities are few and far between. I find when I do finally, you know, get to a face-to-face -face situation, 
I have a hard time just kind of controlling myself because I get so excited about, oh, wow, there's, you know, I'm, I'm seeing you in real life. There's so much to bring to this. And, and but, you know, so that's missing a little bit online. And, and I, I just find the personal part makes a huge difference in sort of filling in that gap. Um, these are, I mean, these are great points that, that you've brought, brought forward um, from your, from your group discussion. So I, I anyway, I, I know that we're, you know, we're, coming up to the top of the hour pretty quickly here. Um, and I didn't expect to get into a huge, huge, deep discussion following this. And I knew that there would be technology problems. And I'm glad we experienced them, because I think we learn a lot from, from this. Um, just actually trying it out, seeing, seeing what we could do um, differently. And so I, probably the best way to, to move forward um, you know, for at this point, since we don't have much time, is um, perhaps we could take some of this discussion to the Moodle forum for week three, and or is it week two? Because week one was week zero or something. But anyway, for this week's discussion, um, and maybe uh, debrief a little bit more because I think really some of the things that I'm seeing coming up in the chat are spot on in terms of how we could have designed this activity differently, what would have improved it. Um, you know, what, what do we do next, that sort of thing. So is everybody game to carry on the conversation a little bit in the Moodle forum? Does that sound like a plan, George? Hi, Sylvia. That sounds like a plan indeed. Um, that the, let me just have a quick step over to the Moodle forum and See where exactly you mean. Which I think it would fit in with teaching groups. Yeah, t the teaching, that, that's what yeah, I was yeah, sort of wondering, you know, which, yeah. in, into which forum would we feed that discussion or would we set up a separate forum for this one? Do you think into think the teaching group? I think it's yeah. the teaching group forums, but set up a separate forum for this one because people that a separate have thread. Group, um, yeah, a separate thread, because people that didn't come might want to join, but they won't know if it's yeah. put in. won't make sense, will it? Yeah. So, uh, Sylvia, you can start a discussion, can't you? Um, could I invite you to, to see that discussion in the teaching group's discussions area? And that, I'm going to just slap a link into here. Um, the link I just pasted should take you straight in. You may, if you're not logged in, that'll take you in as a guest, and you will have to log in if you want to post. But if you are logged into the Moodle, um, that'll take you straight in, in into the logged in, into you as a logged in person, if you see what I mean. Um, does that make sense, Sylvia? Yes, yeah, you're here by a logged in person. <laughs> um, that yeah. makes sense, and I, I'd be happy to start the discussion. I can post a link to the slides and. Um, and you know maybe whatever. Try, I'll try to add a bit of context so that the people who weren't able to join the session will at least um, be able to follow a little bit what we're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, if you post, post a link to the discussion, and uh, as Marion says, great in inspirations to start discuss. Start the discussion synchronously and follow up asynchronously is really. I, I think that that should work. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for you know, bearing with me. This was this was a. Quite an experiment. I said at the beginning that it might not, might not, uh, that it was a risk and it might not work out. Um, and I'm glad you all played along and, and were able to report back. So it was all very, all a very good learning experience. Can I ask everybody to give Sylvia a big round of applause? <laughs> everybody, smile smiling and saying thank you, Sylvia. Indeed, thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, that's been superb. I, um, I'm trusting that most of those dings that I'm hearing are people clapping hands rather than um, particularly raising. Uh, Wheezy number two, uh, do you have your hand up to speak? Or is that uh, a, an applause for? That was an applause. Excellent. Roger's applauding. Betsy's away. Um, I think those uh, questions that you ask about the risk in the design, um, making the activity better, and suggestions for next steps are the kind of things that should be on the organizational uh, 
uh, queries anyway. Um, I believe in taking risks. I think that if I go into a classroom not doing something that I've never done before and that is highly likely to you know, cause me anxiety halfway through the session, then I'm not really working to my best. Uh, to my best. So um, it's always good to try a new technology. I think that's I think that's ideal. Um, the thing that uh, I take away from it, though, of course, is the community and the use of these tools to forge community. And uh, sometimes the tools become part of the part of the challenge. Um, okay. Um, so thank everybody for being here. Are there any questions that anybody needs to ask about the course or about access to the online um, the recordings? I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>